So today, let us talk about modern paratransgenesis. Okay, so for a brief review on the paratransgenesis lecture, that lecture was a discussion of the paper, the first paratransgenesis paper. So we'll briefly go into a review of that, and then I want to cover like modern applications to modern applications of paratransgenesis. So what is paratransgenesis? It's the idea that you can um, modify a symbiont or some organism that lives inside of the host to alter the host itself, okay? So most of the biotechnology things that we've been talking about so far in the class have been, okay, you have an organism, how do you genetically modify that organism? But you don't necessarily have to do that. You might have an organism which has an organism that lives inside of it, and you decide to genetically modify the organism that lives inside of it to affect the host. That's paratransgenesis. Um, so for this to work, you have to be able to sort of like modify the thing that's inside. And the other thing that you need is you need a strategy to spread the modified symbiont. Okay, and this is a good time for me to sort of introduce now the concept of gene drive which I have talked about like maybe like once before for like a couple seconds in a previous lecture. There's gonna be a whole future lecture on gene drive, but just know now that it's the idea that if say you have some population, some wild population X, and if there's ever a situation where like you create a GMO, GMO X, and you prefer this GMO X, like maybe this is a mosquito that doesn't spread disease, or maybe this is a symbiont that prevents disease in mosquitoes, or maybe this is some wild grass that you want to spread. Gene drive is the idea that you have to somehow take this from the lab, put this in the field, and in most situations, you'll do this, it's hard to see the blue dots, maybe I should use green, you'll do this, and what most commonly happens is these genetically modified ones probably can't outcompete X. So what happens is it's very difficult to sort of spread genetically modified organisms into the wild unless they have some kind of like an advantage or you can rig them up with a special system that induces gene drive. So what would happen in a situation of gene drive is you engineer a situation where every generation subsequent there's more and more and more and more of the green and less and less and less of the black until eventually you get whole population replacement so gene drive another way to think of it is like population replacement strategies so paratransgenesis um, has to be linked on some level to some sort of like a gene drive otherwise it, it won't ever work in the field. You might get it to like work in a lab, but it won't ever work in the field unless you have it hooked up to some kind of a spreading mechanism. So that's an important concept that relates to all the papers on paratransgenesis. So what are the advantages? Like why would you do this? Um, <laughs> that kind of scared me, it freaked me out. Uh, okay, so like why would you do this? Um, what are the advantage of it? Okay, so some, some situations where this might be better than modifying the actual host. So let's, let's have as in our minds the example of like, maybe you have like an insect and in that insect lives some symbiont. Okay, and let's just think for the rest of the lecture that that's what we're envisioning for paratransgenesis. Why would you do this? Okay, well, you can engineer situations where this is transient. So perhaps you have a symbiont that can um, perhaps get into a population of insects for a temporary period of time and then it goes away. 
that might actually be a useful thing. So this is sort of opposite of what I just told you with Gene Drive, but it might be actually really useful to do something transient in an ecological population, knowing that that phenotype or that particular modification might go away. You might not want to engineer the ecology permanently. So you can have situations where it's transient by doing this. Um, ease of implementation. So imagine a scenario where you're working with a tsetse fly. Tsetse flies are biting flies from Africa. They get, they bite humans, suck their blood. They get pregnant and then they birth like one live birth. They're a really good example of, they're, they're impossible to genetically modify because, well not impossible, but very like nobody's ever done it before. It's difficult because to genetically modify insects, you have to collect their eggs. You have to like micro inject them and then like rear them. You can't really do that with a tsetse fly because they give live birth. They, they go through a gestation period, so you can't like collect their eggs. So in that situation, it's almost impossible to genetically modify the insect. So one strategy might be if you want to affect the ability of that insect to spread a disease, you could work with its symbionts. That would be a good case of this. Another case of this would be, um, it's, it's really difficult, it's possible, and people have done it, but it's very difficult to genetically modify wasps and bees. So parasitoids and bees, which are important for agriculture, you might resort to a paratransgenesis strategy with those types of creatures because it's just simply easier. Um, and when you're doing paratransgenesis, you're typically working with microbes. So microbes are things you can streak out on plates. They grow real fast. You can genetically modify them and you can see if something works really quickly. Whereas if you're genetically modifying insects, that's a much harder, longer process. Three, cross compatibility. So there might be some situation where you, you figure out a symbiont and that symbiont might be like cross compatible with a few different insects. So this is the case for Wolbachia. Although people have not been able to genetically engineer Wolbachia for paratransgenesis yet, that has not happened. But that's always been one of the dreams is Wolbachia is in like all these different insects. So if we could figure out a way to modify Wolbachia in a paratransgenesis strategy, maybe we could take that Wolbachia and put it in a whole bunch of different insects and use it as like a platform technology. That would be the dream. A fourth thing is this is a concept um, Dawkins talks about evolvability. Okay, this means like the speed of evolution. Anytime you're, anytime you're working with microbes, you can do directed evolution and you can evolve sort of phenotypes really, really fast. So this could be an advantage in the sense that if you're trying to do transgenic insertions in an insect with like individual genes, that process might be super slow, but you might be able to evolve something in a microbe really, really quickly and then transfer that capability into the insect via the microbe. So that would be evolvability. Um, the final thing is fitness considerations. So there might be situations where if you genetically modify the insect, perhaps that has a huge fitness disadvantage and it becomes sickly. Whereas if you modify the symbiont and then you put the symbiont in, you might even be able to engineer the symbiont to provide nutrients or something. So you might be able to essentially create the same phenotype, but enhance the fitness rather than decrease the fitness. So fitness considerations would be important for deciding whether or not to use paratransgenesis or not. These would be the considerations under which you would perhaps do, do a paratransgenesis strategy. Okay, so let's briefly talk about the history of paratransgenesis. Um, example one, which was the Dervasala et al. PNAS. I'll just write the author here. Dervasala, 1997. So this is the older one. According to my understanding of the literature, this is the oldest. This is the first paratransgenesis strategy um, that was sort of ever implemented. And they are working on kissing bugs. And kissing bugs are hemipterans that live in the thatch roofs. 
and they'll come down and bite people when they're sleeping at night and they'll bite them on their face and they'll crap on you and if you get that crap into the bite like if you scratch it or something like that you can get uh, a transference of trypanosomes and it's actually trypanosoma cruzi and this causes Chagas disease and this is a pretty bad disease okay so in this paper they are trying to develop a paratransgenesis, a paratransgenesis strategy in kissing bugs to prevent the transmission of Trypanosoma cruzi and prevent the transmission of Chagas disease, okay? So the gist is, in the kissing bugs, they have a symbiont named Rhodococcus rodnii, okay? And what was their idea? What, from either if you read the paper or if you at least watched the discussion, like what was their plan? So the first thing that they did is their goal is to engineer this. Okay, they want to engineer the Rhodococcus rodnii, which lives in the guts, and they want to engineer it to essentially like inhibit or kill. Trypanosoma cruzi in the gut. Okay, so the first step is they isolate a, a natural plasmid from Rhodococcus rodnii. What would, there's actually a special name for this type of plasmid, which I've talked about in biotechnology. What would you call this? Isolating like a natural plasmid from a strange symbiont and then using that plasmid to to engineer the organism. There's actually a name for that. Do we remember? Yes. So they isolated and engineered a shuttle plasmid. Good. Um, and their idea was they want to engineer the plasmid. So if I were to draw it out. They take the plasmid and they put a promoter. It's a constitutive promoter and they have an origin for Rhodococcus rodnii. And they add in an origin for E. coli so they can engineer the E. coli. And then they add in this gene called sercropin. Let me get a different marker. So, sercropin, that's worse. Sercropin, it, hopefully this one is better. Sercro, uh, sercropin is what's called an AMP. It stands for antimicrobial peptide. These are genes in insects that are expressed and they are immunity proteins that are expressed into the hemolymph, which is the blood of the insect. And what their goal is, is to find pathogenic microbes and then the AMPs insert into the membranes, kind of like BT cry proteins, um, except reciprocal because it's from the insect inserting into the membrane of the bacteria. They insert in and they create a pore. And then as soon as they create a pore, it pops the bacteria and all the contents flow out. So it's an immunity protein that insects make to kill infecting bacterial pathogens or single cell pathogens. Okay, that's sercropin. So their idea is we're gonna put this shuttle plasmid into the symbiont and it's gonna express sercropin and it's gonna kill any trypanosomes that are in the gut. So that was their plan. Um, and then the final part of their plan was figuring out a way to spread that plasmid into the population. How did they figure out how to do that? So the kissing bugs, um, how did, I've talked about this before, so you should remember this. How do the kissing bugs pick up that symbiont? Yeah, the coprophagy. So they eat each other's excrement. 
And so their literal idea was, okay, well, we're going to make, essentially synthesize, synthesize insect poop plus the engineered symbiont with the plasmid. And then their idea was, we'll just spray this poop all over inside the house <laughs> and let the bugs eat it, pick up the symbiont, and then they, boom, supposedly like no more, no more Chagas disease. Like that kind of makes sense? Just the basic premise? Okay. So that was their idea. And again, like this is a pretty big paper because this was like, I think this is the first time somebody is like trying this strategy. Um, Unfortunately, 25 years later, Chagas disease is still around, so the strategy like didn't work that well. Okay. Question about that? Yeah. You said something about antibiotics to make sure that they're keeping bugs in or if they have this symbiont. Yeah. If they have to get it through eating food, what if they didn't not have it yet? So, so in if I remember correctly, in the lecture, if you if you cure them, they the symbiont is essential, and they die because they it, they fail to molt. They fail to molt. But I think there's like um, a period under which this happens. So I think what they did is they again I think that they treat the in the poop, probably in the frass, they would add some antibiotic. And so in that situation where the kissing bug is eating that poop, it's also in theory, perhaps absorbing the antibiotic. The antibiotic would kill the native symbionts and then they would be replaced by the engineers. When they hatch, do they have it in the gut? When they hatch, do they have it in the gut? So could the first female just eat their monoplasm? You're saying when this kissing bug lays an egg, is there, symb is there symbionts in there? Not, not that I'm aware of, because in order for that to happen, the symbionts would have to invade the ovaries. Because they eat the egg, they give them their first meal, do the modified bacteria get eggs? Get eggs. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That's smart. You're saying they just need to take eggs, hatch them, feed them the symbiont right away, and then they have it. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, okay. Okay, so example two. Let's talk about some modern papers where people are using this strategy. So um, this is Wang et al. I used to teach a whole lecture on this paper uh, in science. And the title is Driving Mosquito Refractoriness to Plasmodium Falciparum with Engineered Symbiotic Bacteria. And this is Marcelo Jacobs Lorena's lab at Johns Hopkins University. So they are working on Anopheles mosquitoes. And Anopheles mosquitoes transmit malaria. Okay. So, and the way that if you, you don't need to know the malaria life cycle for the test. Um, but if you don't know it, what happens is a mosquito bites a human, picks up some gametes of the malaria parasites, and they live in the gut of the mosquito. And essentially in the gut of the mosquito, the malaria parasites will mate, okay? And then they have a cycle where they will then, after they've mated, they will create what's called an oocyst. And then it will burst out of the gut epithelial lining and get into the hemolymph get into the salivary glands, and then the next time the mosquito bites, it will spit out plasmodium, which is the name of the parasite, and that's how malaria gets transmitted. Okay, so the idea, again, very, very similar. There's a pathogen in the gut, and there's also other microbes that live in the gut of the mosquito, so their premise is, let's just engineer some of the gut microbes in the mosquito to kill plasmodium. Like that's a pretty simple idea. Okay, so this was a long process of attempting this engineering project. The first um, line of thinking on this 
was a paper, again, from Marcello's lab, but first author, Mike Berlay, who is, I think, a professor of entomology at University of Arizona. In his paper, what they did is they took E. coli. So their first attempt was, let's just take E. coli, because we can engineer E. coli. Let's take E. coli, and E. coli makes proteins called OMPs, which are the outer membrane proteins, and the E. coli's outer membrane gets stuck with these outer membrane proteins. And so their strategy was, let's take a peptide, which is called SM1. SM1 is a small peptide, so it's just a small series of amino acids, and it has a unique ability in that when there's a mosquito that has malaria in its gut, if you add SM1 peptide, the SM1 peptide will essentially like bind to the epithelial lining, and it will, through competitive inhibition, block the malaria's ability to like invade the lining of the gut. Does that make sense? It's just literally competitive in inhibition. It's blocking, blocking sort of like the receptor site. So their idea was, let's just take an outer membrane protein A and let's fuse to it SM1. So we will produce these E. coli that are essentially like lined with the skin that should block malaria from invading the gut lining. Okay, that was the first attempt. So they do this and essentially like the problem with it was, the problem with it was that the, uh, the competing peptide is stuck to the E. coli. So they didn't get an efficient like, um, I guess release of the SM1 peptide, which makes sense. That's not what they were trying to do. They're engineering to be stuck to the E. coli. That turned out to be like a problem. Okay, didn't work very well. So their next strategy was to fix this by a couple mechanisms, okay? The next strategy was, okay, well, if E. coli doesn't work that well, and if it, if it doesn't work very well to engineer an outer membrane protein, what they decided was, first, let's get a different symbiont, which is called Pantoia. I wanna make sure I spell it right. Yep, Pantoia. Agglomerants. Okay, so there. So again, to fix the last strategy, their idea was okay. Well, let's go out. Let's find a different microbe that actually lives inside guts of Anopheles mosquitoes, not just E. coli. Let's take this and let's fix this problem by using a secretion system to secrete things like SM1 or things like. Um, uh, things that are going to be essentially like lytic factors for plasmodium, like AMPs. Okay, so what they did here then is now they're not doing that. What they're doing is they're producing some kind of an E. coli, which then acts as a factory and pumps out these factors into the gut. And now they should be able to like freely diffuse and either inhibit the malaria or lyse the plasmodium parasite. Okay, so they did that. This is published in PNAS, and the first author is the last name Wang. Okay, and essentially, like it worked, but the problem was this bacteria. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, um, it didn't essentially like establish itself in wild populations and wild mosquitoes. It didn't establish itself very well. So like it worked in the lab, you could inhibit in malaria in the lab, but it didn't work very well in the actual like mosquitoes out in the wild. Okay, so then their third iteration of the strategy is to try to fix that problem. So they found a new symbiont or bacteria or gut microbe called serratia, okay? And this one, essentially like it lives in mosquito guts and it has like a powerful ability to spread. So in the paper, and this is the, this is the, this is the Wang et al. 2017 science. 
in the paper, they describe how this strain of serratia, um, it spreads by invading the germline, the ovaries, just like kind of like Wolbachia, gets in the ovaries and then when eggs are laid, in the paper there's actually a figure for this, in the eggs, when the eggs are laid, the eggs are laid like coated with this bacteria. And so it has essentially maternal transmission, check, and it spreads really well and it spreads transstadially, which means it's passed from larvae to pupae to adult. So it had kind of like all the good things. And then they engineered it in a very similar way where they took a shuttle plasmid, uh, they engineered a secretion system, so they would have taken a secretion system tag, put a promoter, and then what they did, actually what they did in the paper is, they stringed together like a bunch of factors as like a fusion protein, and each of these factors has like the ability to kill malaria. So this is, if you remember back, this is like a pyramid strategy. Put like a bunch of killing things so they would have included sm1 a bunch of different lytic factors and then they actually included this protein called scorpion scorpion is the scorpion sercropin sercropin so it's an amp from a scorpion and this construct worked pretty well and it was able to inhibit malaria oocytes in the gut, and it was able to spread in the wild. So it kind of had like everything you would like to see with respect to paratransgenesis. And that was in 2017, so that was four years ago. So we'll see in the future if this thing works or not, if they get any like field trials. A little bit early to tell, I would guess, but hopefully we'll see in the future some update on this. So that is a, again, example two of a paratransgenesis strategy. Okay, let's do the third example. Example three is Leonard et al. 2020 science. This one is on honeybees. Okay. And honeybees are faced with this colony collapse disorder. Okay. Colony collapse disorder is kind of like a broad spectrum, I guess, uh, name that kind of identifies like a bunch of problems with honeybees and in certain situations these problems can like compile and you can get like collapse of the hive. Some of the problems that go into this are mites. Varroa destructor is the big one and the mites are vectors which means they transmit path, uh, virus pathogens one of which is deformed wing virus. Okay so just essentially know that like honeybees can have problems with mites. If they get infected with mites, the mites can also spread them diseases. So now they're like faced with like two problems at the same time that can compound with other things and you can get like colony collapses. Okay, so this is a big issue. People really wanna figure out a way to like protect honeybees from mites and to protect them from the viruses that the mites spread. So this strategy in this um, research paper, and this was a project out of Texas. Um, it was a collaborative project amongst two labs. Nancy Moran's lab is one. I forget the other one. Um, forgive me, but look at the paper. Sean Leonard's the first author. Um, and in this strategy, they take the symbiont snodgrassella alvei. Two eyes or one? Alvei. Okay, so this is like a gut symbiont of honeybees, and they are able to culture it, and they are able to pull out a plasmid, 
and they're able to engineer shuttle plasma. And so again, you're seeing kind of like a similar theme in that first thing is like, can you isolate the path? Can you isolate like a symbiont? Can you grow it? That's kind of like the first thing that's super important. If you can't grow it, you can't engineer it. Can you find like a plasmid? Can you find like a shuttle plasmid? Will it uptake any plasmids? That's the second kind of thing in these strategies, okay? And then once they found a plasmid, they built a really cool construct that, if here's the plasmid, their strategy was RNAi. So the next lecture for Friday will be the mechanism of RNAi. So I'm just gonna introduce it here. RNAi is the concept of you can produce essentially what is double-stranded RNA. And under certain situations, the cell will see this double-stranded RNA and it activates like an immunity pathway and it will process this double-stranded RNA into essentially like a single-stranded kind of like heat-seeking target. And this thing can complex with messenger RNA that it matches. And when this happens, there's a protein complex called the risk complex, which then degrades the transcript, okay? So what you need to remember now until at least the next lecture is RNAi is a means of knock down of messenger RNA. So you can pick a single messenger RNA. You can say, I wanna knock down that transcript and you can engineer it through the sequence to knock down an individual transcript. And you can imagine if you were to knock down a constitutive housekeeping gene, that could kill the cells or that could kill the organism if you're knocking down something that's essential. So the gist here is they want to engineer a plasmid for Snodgrassella alvei or alvi that can kill um, mites and that can also inhibit deformed wing virus, okay? So what they do in RNAi, you need a system to produce double-stranded RNA. Double-stranded RNA is not normal. Your cell doesn't normally see that. So the way that they do that is they put a promoter facing forward of the multi-cloning site, and then they put a promoter reverse orientation facing backwards in the multi-cloning site. And then in the multi-cloning site, they put whatever their target is gonna be. So in the case of deformed wing virus, they take a little piece of the actual virus, the deformed wing virus, and they put it in there. And then now these promoters are making two messenger RNAs. If the, if the RNA polymerase reads it this way, it's making this transcript, a little chunk of the deformed wing virus, and if the RNA polymerase comes on here and reads it this way, it's making this transcript. Okay, so this would be five to three. This would be three to five. So they're making sense and antisense messenger RNA transcripts. These can complex because they match. It's the same thing, you just read forward or backwards. They match. This is then double-stranded RNA. This can then be activated as an RNAi, like in the RNAi pathway, okay? So that's how they do it. In the case of the deformed wing virus, in the case of the mites, they essentially pick like 15 essential genes in mites, and they put little chunks of those genes as a fusion, again, like a pyramid strategy. And now what's being produced is double-stranded RNA that represents little chunks of 15 essential genes in the mites, okay? And once they put this plasmid back in the Snodgrassella alvei, and they give the bees the Snodgrassella alvei, they demonstrate that they are protected from um, both the mites and the virus. So good, that's it. So those are sort of like three examples, modern examples of paratransgenesis strategies. Um, and so I would just encourage you to consider if you are ever working on some kind of an organism 
that is difficult to engineer, you might ask yourself, is there possibly a symbiont that I could isolate and engineer, which would make my life a little bit easier? Okay.